Okay, today we are going to start a strategy design approach. Okay, so basically now we are talking about a totally different idea. So far, in Post Concrete, we have been talking about that we are going to design the reinforced concrete with the assumption that we are dealing with cross sections, and we have been working with cross section. We designed the cross section for bend for moment and shear, and we assume that the bending moment is going to come to the section, shear is going to come to the section, but we don't look at how the load is transferred through the through the member. We assume it is being transferred through bending and shear, but in reality, the load may not be transferring in bending and shear as we assume and because we are making some assumption about plane sections remain plane we are making many assumptions and those assumptions may not be correct second thing is that one of the things that we have so far learned that we do not rely on concrete for tension especially in bending in shear a little bit but bending not so much so if we decide that concrete cannot take tension at all in any mode, then we can simplify our problem into another way. Secondly, we start to look at how the load is really being transferred rather than assuming that it is going to cause bending and shear. So these two things come to this physical way of looking at the, the structures. And this was done a long time ago by a German engineer in the 20s, 1920s, and then nobody believed him, and he did some work, and then people forgot all about it, until another 60, 70 years, somebody said, oh, that was a very good idea, why don't we go back to that idea, and then this becomes now a new, not a new, but a revived approach. So let's talk about it. <coughs> you remember this one, I showed you this slide before, and I'm going to show you it again. This is a truss, and you know how the load is transferred in truss. You apply the load, it goes to compression, tension, tension, compression. Yellow is compression, blue is tension. It's very clear. We can see the load being transferred like this. We design the diagonal members for compression, vertical for tension, bottom for tension, top for compression. It's not no confusion about that, right? It's as simple as that. When it comes to beam, we assume, same height, same everything, we assume that actually the load is going to cause some bending moment and shear, and the load is going to transfer by something different from that. But really speaking, if you look at it in detail, you will find that you have stirrups in the beam, and then you also have internal compression struts being formed, same way as that one. So there's a compression there in the section, which is the same, and we have a tension at the bottom, compression at the top, and if you draw that, that dotted line is compression, and the diagonal compression is here. So that is the basis for the shear, we have already seen that. So which means, really speaking, there is a truss hiding in the beam. So why don't we make use of that hidden truss and design that truss rather than trying to design the beam for bending and shear? Don't you think that's a good idea? The only thing is that in that case, we have to neglect all of this black concrete, which is not taking part in any of those struts and ties, right? So if we neglect that there is no concrete other than the one needed for the compression and all concrete intention is gone, has disappeared, then this should be fine, correct? Okay. So which means this is a safe assumption. We are assuming that all concrete not in compression does not exist. And all tension is taken by steel, all compression by concrete. So we call it a load bound solution. That means this is a safe solution. Actual capacity will be higher than our assumption because concrete does take some tension. And concrete is only going to go away in some places where tension is high. In all of the rest places, concrete is actually going to remain there. Right? You have seen in your beam that beam <coughs> crack, but it doesn't really go away. So, which means that if we use this concept of the strut and tie, compression and tension, and assume very basic assumption, which we already know, concrete carries no tension, concrete takes all the compression, steel carries only tension, steel does not necessarily take much compression. If we use that concept, we can simplify our problem a lot. Especially for cases which are more complicated than this one. And that brings us to 
the this guy's principle. And he said that if there is a disturbance in a field, in any concrete or any medium, after some time, the disturbance becomes uniform. That means there is a local disturbance in the field, in the in a, in, but after some time, the materials redistribute themselves through strain, and then the things become constant. Now, in this section, plane sections remain plane is fine because stress state is uniform for a load like this. However, in this region, it is not correct. It is going to bend like this, so the cross section here will be bending more than, so the cross section, part of the cross section here will bend more than the cross section here, is obvious. But here, all the cross section will bend or deform the same way. So which means that in this particular region, we cannot use the concept of plane sections remain and we don't know what's going on there. If I cut a section here, we know stress state will be like this, constant. But if I cut a section here, I don't know what is happening here. Which means that we can use some other ways to transfer the load between the section which is uniform and the application of the load. And this portion is called disturbed region or D region. This portion is called B region or Bernoulli's region. So Bernoulli's theorem says that plane, and plane sections remain plane, and this guy, Simbrand, says that no, there is an area near the loading which is not going to be to follow that. So we are going to combine two, two, two persons' opinion into one approach, Bernoulli and St. Bernard. And we will come up with this idea. So in this region, we will use the concept of the strut and tie, and here we can use either strut and tie or plane section remain plane concept. So we will go step by step. And this is again another way of looking at the same thing. If you apply the load here, just close to the load, you will have that, and after the load, it will become like that, like that, like that, right? You can, you can imagine that. So immediately into the load, the deformation will be non-linear, non-uniform, and after that, slowly less, then after some time, it will become uniform. So this region is Bernoulli, that region is disturbed. So we are now going to really be talking, so far we have been talking about Bernoulli's region. That means the plane sections remain essentially plane, and the, the cross section is behaving as a rotating plane or bending plane. But we have not dealt with this portion yet. And there is no easy way to deal with that portion, except strut and tie model, all right? And in which case, we will we will come to that in a minute, how, how that works. So load bound theorem of plasticity, this is what that I talked about. We are saying that if we assume that all concrete is gone and steel is going to yield, then it's a plastic condition. Right? The whole section has become, it's not plastic anymore, it's plastic, and it is a load bound theorem. It is safe to, to make this assumption, and if we use this assumption, we greatly simplify our complicated problems, like the one he mentioned, transfer girders. For this to be true, crushing of concrete does not occur prior to yielding of reinforcement ties or stir. This is an important condition, that the structure that we are trying to design has the ability to deform before crushing. Your beam yielded before crushing, correct? That is the kind of beam that we are talking about. So if the structure has sufficient reinforcement, just enough reinforcement to yield first, and concrete does not crush, then we can use the concept of plasticity. And then we can simplify our design problems. So for elastic, elastoplastic materials, the material flow is based on, on Prescan or von Mises criteria of shear flow. So this is basically steel. People, mechanical engineers, do not deal with other things. They always deal with those two, these two stresses, which is a combined state of stress on a material in three dimension or two dimension, in which shear and, and axial stresses, everything come together and the material starts to flow in a plastic manner, right? 
but in which direction it will flow will depend on the relative value of shear and bump and the moment stresses, principal directions. So that is there. Concrete is a little bit different because it has two materials combined together. So we have failure of paste or aggregate in tension and loss of aggregate in interlock and crushing of aggregate. So it has stages in conversion, right? So the concrete will flow or concrete will fail due to many reasons and many stages. So it's not a very simple elastoplastic material. It's a, it goes like this. If you remember, concrete goes like, like that. So it goes through all that gradually. Many things happen and it follows this, 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 this curve. So it cannot be truly, so if we, however, if we neglect concrete in tension and assume that it is never going to be a in compression, we can create a combination material which pair, which is based on the elastoplasticity of steel only. So we can convert the concrete into an equivalent elastoplastic based on the steel properties, assuming concrete compression does not happen. So we take that out. Second thing is that you remember, if you put the load on the concrete slender, it moves out and crushes, right? It breaks. Have you seen this? So the test, right? So you put the load like this, but it breaks the other direction, cause and ratio. And that is another way the concrete will fail. So we have to make sure that if the compression is too high, the concrete does not fail in the other direction. So not only the concrete should not fail in compression, it should also not fail in tension produced by compression, which is the other direction, right? So if there are going to be struts in the system, they have to be strong both for the compression, direct compression failure, what I described earlier, and tension due to compression failure, okay? So we will come to step by step into these things. You remember this? So this is for a cross section. Now we are not talking about anymore. We already passed this. Now we are talking about something else. So this does not hold true anymore. We are not worried about this, this thing anymore. No bending. So this doesn't exist. We are not going to talk about bending. We are only going to talk about tension and compression. Just like a truss. So this equation, not useful anymore in what we are going to discuss now. This is what is going to be important now. The shear principal stresses, the way we discussed, but we are also not going to talk about shear separately anymore. We are going to talk about the effect of the shear, which is tension and compression. So you remember all of that. So we, we are going to now consider the net effect of shear and bending, which is the principal stresses or principal direction. And one of them is going to be tension, one of them is going to be compression. Compression is going to be concrete, tension is going to be steel. So based on those assumptions, we are going to, to simplify the whole thing and only keep the stresses which, are, which can actually exist. So wherever there is a tension in concrete, that stress will be gone, that portion of the, the section will be gone, that, and only tension will remain, which will be taken by steel. So if there's a tension, there must be steel. If there's a compression, there must be concrete. It's as simple as that. And all of these equations will not be used anymore because we are not going to deal with shear anymore. So you can see now how simplified our design can become because we all the big equations that we we made no longer use no longer needed. Let's say basically and why? Because the axial stress is the end point of everything. It's either compression or tension. So if it is either compression and tension, what does it mean? Trust. Truss is a compression or tension, correct? When you design a truss, remember either it has a tension or a compression, there is nothing else possible in a truss mechanism. So which means that we come back to the truss analogy or truss system, that everything, every structure ultimately is a truss system in which there is only tension and only compression, bending and shear and torsion have disappeared because their effect has been transformed into tension and compression. And if we can deal with that, then we can deal with anything behind that, which is causing tension and compression. So based on that, 
we can simply, you know, step by step converge to our solution. So the question is, when designing concrete beams for bending, last time I also already asked this question, that we ignore the tension in concrete, but when designing for shear, we try to account for the VC with all the equations. But if we ignore VC, then it's too simple, it's very nice. nice. Because only steel is left to take the shear, only steel is left to take the tension. So the problem becomes too sim very simple, and that's exactly what we're going to do now in this. So we come to the plus analogy of concrete members. And back to again, so this is how it looks like. And we are now only going to see, we are going to forget all about everything else, only concentrate on the, try to find the hidden truss in a, in a concrete member and design that hidden truss. And if we design that hidden truss, member should be fine. Right? So you can read all of that. Basic concept, section is fully cracked. Assumption number one, it is a safe assumption. Section is not fully cracked, not everywhere, but it's an assumption, which is a safe assumption. Concrete takes no tension, it's an assumption, it's not true. Concrete does take some tension, but we are ignoring it, so we are safe. All compression is taken by struts, correct, but steel also takes some compression, but we are going to neglect that, again, safe assumption. All tension is taken by ties, correct, but steel or concrete also takes some tension, we are going to ignore that, safe assumption. Ties and struts provide a stable mechanism, this is the key. The ties and strut that you create must be a stable mechanism. It must have a stable way to go. So which means there should be ties where there is tension and there should be struts where there is compression. Otherwise, it is an unstable mechanism and it will fall down. So this is the only requirement from this assumption. The only critical requirement is that the truss and ties and struts that we assume must form a stable system, not an unstable system. And the good news is, this is a lower bound solution, actual safety of the structure will be higher than the computed value or the design solution, always. It cannot be lower than that. So there is an added factor of safety that will come in. Application, post tracking, shear behavior and design, design of deep beams and shear walls, design of corbels, brackets, joints, and many things. In fact, everything now. But there are, now in engineering, there are two groups of engineers or researchers. One is saying, no, 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 no. This is, you know, now we have computers, we can do the stress analysis, we can do all of that, and why should we use stuff in that? If you talk to that about some people, they will, they will reject it outright. That this is an old concept, we don't need it anymore, this was developed. When we didn't have computers, now we have computers, we can do finite element, we can do all of that. But a lot of people say, but finite element does not give me the physical way how the load is transferred. I have no confidence on the finite element. And the finite element cannot handle the micro packing of concrete and so many phenomena, bonds, slippage, so many things the finite element cannot yet handle. So rather than relying on a procedure which is not clear, we rely on a procedure which is clear and lower bound. So that's why for critical members, like transfer girders, people prefer to use strut and tie, deep beams and other things, because it's very clear and very reliable. Anyway, so we will continue to talk about this. <coughs> there is a concept of micro truss model before this overall truss model, that on a very small portion, there is already a micro truss mechanism existing at every location because there is that triangle, uh, that rectangle with the tension and compression, the one that I showed you earlier in that beam. So because of the principal direction, there is always going to be a principal direction, compression and tension. So in fact, there is a micro truss existing at all locations everywhere in the concrete system. So if you, and this is an interesting research, by people, and we also did that here in AIT, where one of the pieces was on this thing, that you take a concrete beam and you mesh it into many, many elements, like this one, frame elements, right? Thousands of triangles you create, 
nothing else. There is no concrete. It is just a mesh of those triangles. That's it. You apply a load and you analyze it. What will happen is that when you apply the load, some of these triangles or members will have zero forces. Some of these will have tension. Some of these will have compression. There will be no shear, there will be no bending moment because these are all trusses. So the next step is that if you apply a small load, you do the analysis. So all, all of the members which do not have any force at all, that means they are not contributing to the load. So we can remove them. And we will be left with the triangles which are or members which are carrying the force. Then we apply the load again and check again. Right? In the modified model. Then if still there are some members with no force, we remove them again. And then by doing it over many times, many circles, many iterations, we can remove all the members or all the small members here which are not doing anything. And we will come up with the final load transfer path connected by those small trusses. Right? So we can find that and this is very interesting because the people have created animations about this one. For each load step, first step, these, these, these members go on. Second step, these members go on. Third step, these members go on. So after that, and then you see a very nice, very clear truss or load transfer mechanism appearing. Right? And then final trusses that you come, you, you are left with, you decide which one is in compression, which was in tension. The one in tension, you put reinforcement there, and the one which has compression, you check it for concrete, and you're done. Right? So from a micro truss mechanism, by eliminating the unused elements, we can come to the big truss mechanism. And this is quite interesting to watch. And you should, you know, there are many papers about that. So you can read all about that. So now ACI in 131811 just very recently have come back moving towards certain time more than they used to earlier. Gradually they have been moving towards it because they find it easy, simple and quite useful in many cases. And simplify the shear design, simplify the torsion design by using this concept. In fact the shear design and torsion design has become much simpler than it used to be in the previous course because they are moving towards this concept and foundation design and other things. So same idea, take the element, you put the axial stresses, you put the shear stresses, you calculate the principal stresses and from the principal stresses, you eliminate the one that have no stress and find the tension and compression and then you do that. And we call them, so we divide, we can divide the beam into two regions, B region, plane section remain plane, D region, disturbed region, where it is, it's not true. For, this, for D regions, we use strut and tie. For B, B regions, we can, we can use conventional theory, or we can use the strut and tie even for the beam region. There is no reason why we cannot use strut and tie in both the regions. But you cannot use the conventional theory in D regions. So that is the drawback of the conventional theory that that does not apply to D region. Whereas the strut and tie mechanism applies to both D regions and B regions. For D regions, we have to use it. For B regions, we have an option to use it. Okay. So I will show you as we go along. So let's first look at the deep member and look at this one now. What is a B region versus a D region? In a typical beam, every beam, there is a D region here, there is a B region here, D region here. So basically D regions <coughs> exist near the supports and they exist at the point of heavy concentrated loads. And typically the length of D region is equal to the height of the member, 45 degree concept, typically, not necessarily. Typical. And so this one will be D region, that will be B region. This is extended because D 
the half the depth will be here, half here, so it extended, so it will be up to here. So if there is another point load, another D region will be created. So at every heavy point load, a D region will be created. Every support has a D region. So if you want to design a beam, the conventional design, bending moment in shear, will hold true in purple color. It will not hold true in green color. And that is why, if you notice now, if you go back to the code, and you carefully see that shear design is done at the D distance base of the support. After that, they don't talk about the shear. So you can take the shear at the D distance from the base of the support and use the same shear reinforcement for the remaining because other inside we don't know. And the shear doesn't matter. So that is why the beam design is typically based on the shear calculated at a distance D from the support. Because this is a disturbed region. Shear does not exist here as, as conventional shear. Bending does not exist here in this portion. And if you go into the details of the beam inside and try to see the stress traje trajectories, these are the trajectories or the center lines of the principal stresses, tension and compression, for a beam loaded like that. So this is tension, and solid lines are compression. And from the angle of these principal directions, you can determine, you can see where is the bending governing, where is the shear governing. Bending is governing where the tension and compression are parallel, right? Tension, compression at the top. So portion of the beam where the tension and compression lines are parallel to each other or horizontal, that is the B region, where bending moment is going to govern the design. Where the compression is inclined, and tension is inclined, that is the shear region, where principal stresses are at 45 or some angle. Right? So this is a very good way to look at how the principal tensiles, strain, and stresses trajectories will look like. And if this is the distance A, this is D, D of this size, this is D, this is 3D, D, so this is the B region, D region, D region, D region, D region, cylinder beam behavior, deep beam behavior. So people try to see, because if this portion is all D, this is a disturbed beam, there is no B there. So this portion of the beam cannot be designed by conventional theory at all, because there is no B region. So it must be designed by the beam, deep beam concept, which is certain time. And here B region, you can, and here again B region. So if the beam is smaller, let's say the support was only here, there will be no B region left at all. And this whole beam must be designed by another method and not by the conventional method. Let's look at this again. We are saying that when you have a load or a, or a support, inside the beam, there's going to be shear and bending moment. But those shear and bending moment produce the principal strains and principal stresses, one in tension, one in compression. And if the strains are primarily parallel to each other, like this one here and this one here, nearly parallel, these means that there is going to be bending here primarily. There's compression at the top, there's tension at the bottom. That's what we designed the beam for, right? That's what we think the beam is. But if the direction of the compression is not horizontal, it's inclined, that means we have shear is governing because shear is where the principal directions are. If there is no bending, only shear, principal direction is 45. We, many times we know no circle, right? So if it is like that, so we can see that shear is going to be <coughs> governing. And other places, it's a combination of that. And if shear is governing primarily, there is no parallel lines here. That means Bernoulli's theorem of plane section to main plane does not apply. So we are looking for members, or we are looking at members in which the B region is too small or does not exist. So we are looking for a way to design such beams, which are primarily D region, which are disturbed regions, primarily governed by 
the principal stresses which are not horizontal, which are inclined or greatly inclined, right? And the inclination of the principal direction will determine the load transfer path, which can be determined by micro truss analysis. That's all we are trying to say so far. So this method of design is quite useful because it simplifies the whole thing here. Now if you look at another structure, a typical beam like that, you will find that this is all D-region foundation. Mostly is D-region. Orbital and this bracket is D-region. This joint, both direction D by D, is D-region. There's an opening here, discontinuity, is a D-region. There's a heavy point load, there's a D-region. There's a support here, there's a D-region. So, you can see that in, unless the beam is very simple, the D-region dominates many types of structures, which means that the bending theory, bending formulas, bending equations, ETAPS analysis, ETAP design, or SAP design, will not work in all of these shaded areas. And you need to do something more than that. That is what we are trying to say. That our theories so far that we have studied do not hold true for all of the shaded areas shown in this diagram and in the previous also. And we are not, that's why we are looking for the alternate method to design. This is another same way we plot from some program linear analysis you can find. In SAP also you can do that. Many programs can give you the direction of the principal strains and stresses and you can detect the trust direction from there. Of course we will go there in a minute. And shear mechanism all of that basically ends up the same thing. Trusses, diagonal members, diagonal, diagonals controlling the stress flow. That is the key, right? So deep or shallow? Now we are going to talk about which beam is called deep so that we can use the certain tie or has it disturbed region, which beam is shallow, so I can use my novel theory, how do we decide, right? So shallow members is where most of the beam length is B region. If most of the beam is B, then it's a shallow beam. If the length of the deep section is very small, less than 10%, or 5 to 20 percent, 20 percent, that's something, some number, is a shallow beam, right? Deep is members where most of the beam length is in D region. You would say, oh, that doesn't help me much. I can see that. If it's all D, it's deep. If it's all B, it's shallow, right? Then there's another interesting two more terms, thin beam and thick beam. Thin, thick mem thin member and thick member. <coughs> These are now getting a bit confusing. You have studied finite element? Not yet, right? Okay. This is going to be a major question when you're going to choose whether you're going to use in the analysis thick beam element or thin beam element. And this is physical for the design. Are you going to use shallow beam theory or deep beam theory? Two are independent and not related to each other. Unfortunately, but they create the most confusion in engineers' mind. They're not sure. They sometimes think thin is the same as shallow or deep is the same as thick. They're not, right? So I don't want to go into too much detail, maybe next time, next term, you can ask Dr. Benchen, or you can ask me. But thin membrane is, flexural deformation is governing, shear deformation is governing, right? They are related, but not the same thing. 
thin means most of the deformation is coming from, or stiffness is coming from bending. Thick means most of the stiffness is coming from shear. Shear deformation is governing. So let me not go into that a lot at this time because it will be not possible to cover all the details. Let's focus on shallow and deep. So shallow and deep is a physical definition. Thin and thick is a analytical definition based on how the finite element solution is formulated. And the other upper one is how the design is carried out. So what are the major concerns for deep, deep members? What are the reasons that we are concerned about deep members? Number one, no linear stress distribution. So our equation, cross-section design, CSI call, section designer, gear cannot be used. So there, that's it. That's the first concern. Second is possibility of lateral buckling. Why? Because compression. So if you have a compression on a beam, deep beam, the beam, the top of the beam, when it, when it tries to have a lot of load, it may buckle out of the plane. Just like, just like the, okay, this one. Yeah, my my phone is. You put this beam here, and then you put a lot of load outside this direction. This, this direction is very stiff. This direction, it can buckle because there's a way to be compression at the top, right? Because of that compression, just like a column, it can buckle. So the deep beam can buckle in compression, which is not possible for a small beam or, or a shallow beam. So possible of lateral buckling outside the plane. That is very critical because it's too much compression now. Very stiff elements because they are deep, they have very large moment of inertia, very stiff. Then you'll say, okay, so so what? They're stiff. Isn't that good? What's wrong with that? Okay, let me ask you, what's wrong with very stiff elements? That's one second, that's good. One, what else? Correct. It will attract a lot of load and especially very sensitive to deformation. Very small foundation settlement or deformation will cause huge amount of reactions and forces. So I remember there was one, one case where uh, we have a shear wall here and there's a column here that there's a beam which is a bit deep connected to the shear wall and column. So it attracted a lot of force like you said. So the engineer increase the size because the capacity is not enough. When you increase the size, it attract more force. So if you increase the size more, it attract more force because it's becoming bigger. You still cannot design it until the beam is equal to the flow depth. No more room to extend anymore and still cannot design. So sometimes you cannot make the things too stiff because they will attract so much force that you cannot design it. So he, he wanted to discuss with me and I, I, and I said, what should I do? I said, Simple. Don't let the forces come to the beam. When you're connecting the shear wall, put a hinge there. So no moment will come and you only need a very small beam and that's it. End of the problem. So sometimes you have to not make it stiff, but go the other way to make it work. Right? So stiff, very stiff elements sometimes are not good. Very sensitive to differential settlement, as I mentioned, because of their size and stiffness. And reinforcement development anchorage is a big problem. The problem is that when you have a deep element like that, and then the reinforcement comes here then there is no room, the, the stress is very high, and then there is no room, not enough length for this reinforcement to be developed. So you need to bend it, but still not enough. So the reinforcement, you need the length to develop, and there is not enough length for the bars to develop. So you get into problems. So sometimes we have to take the reinforcement out, put, put the plates here, and put the bolts here, because you cannot develop them in the deep, deep members. So development of reinforcement, becomes a 
issue. And high stress at support and load points. So this very high local stresses generate because they are carrying very large loads. So those are the local issues. So when you design deep members, although we can design them based on the stretch and tire concept, but there are other things that we must take, take into account. You, we must consider to make sure that this does not happen. So when you design deep beams or deep members, we can use a simple way to design them, but these issues still remain, which need to be handled. So this is how the stress diagram will look like if you use SAP 2000 or any program to analyze a deep beam. So if I take a beam, which is length and height are almost the same, it's not a beam really, it's a solid block of deep thing, you will find that there is no tension, no compression, there's just, stress is just everywhere. There's no concept of tension compression. The stress just distributes equally in every direction because it's too deep to develop any deformation, any stresses or any strains. If you increase a little bit more, then tension starts to develop, compression starts to develop in this area, and then you start to see, see tension spreading more, compression spreading more, and here you start to see the load direction forming. And then compression, so in this case, there's a complicated stress pattern here. Here, there is a no compression. You can see that here and here like this. So this is what we are looking for. So if you look at this stress flow or compression flow, this can, can tell you that actually the load is just going there directly. Through that, it's going to support. And this is what we are saying. Deep members, the, the loads are transferred through the member through direct flow of the forces, through principal, direct, principal stresses and principal strains without causing any major bending and shear. So there is going to be no shear, no bending here, because load just goes there, goes like that. Similarly, it can go like that, it can go like that, so this is the direction. So this it will form like an arch or a truss inside to support that load, right? So you could easily take out this portion, if the support is there, it will stay there, or you just put one tie here and it will stand. And longer beams, Come longer, still can transfer, and if it goes very long, now you can see that there is no direct path from the load to the support. This is not a deep beam anymore because if I go back, and until here, there was a direct path between the yellow color was going up to the point, up to the load. So the load can flow through yellow path and yellow path here, right? So up to here, it is still a true deep beam, all disturbed region. But as soon as I, we increase the length, it is now still here. It is, this is a flatter portion now. So this, for, so this yellow does not touch this load anymore. So there's a flat portion in the middle. This is now B region, where bending is occurring before it becomes D. And in this case, it is quite long. So now you can see D region, B region, D region. So from the analysis, finite element analysis, using any program, you can identify by looking at the stress direction or tension and compression, you can identify the D and B regions. And this is what we try to do. One of the thesis, which I will present to you later, one of the students here, he took the output from SAP 2000, did the analysis in SAP, took the output, and then eliminated all the portions which were in compression or in a with zero stress and then from that he tried to extract and then look at the principal stresses and he tried to extract the hidden truss and he created a very nice program to do that. So when you run a program model in SAP you can take the output 
and based on the output, you can find the hidden trust step by step. It looks very nice. And then you can design it. But most of the time, it's easy to do. So that's the shear plots. So basically, if you look at that, tension and compression, compression is going like this, it looks like that. Right? Tension, compression, truss is complete, you don't need anything else. No bending, no shear. Correct? Next step, same thing, truss is visible, you can form the truss from the diagram, it looks fine. Tension and compression is there, you can find your truss. Next one, now there's a horizontal portion in the truss, which means that now you need, and this is very important point, as soon as you cannot find a direct path to the support, you need a flat portion of the truss, you need more members, right? And that is where the bending comes in. So this is actually the bending portion which means that load from here cannot go there, so load goes from here, you need to carry it back and then carry to the support. So to carry the load back, you need tension because you need to hang it. So if this does not exist, the load will go like this and fall down. Okay? So the load is actually trying to go down and it is going to fall down. If this does not exist, it will simply fall down. This piece will break up and fall down. But if you take this load back up through a tie or a stirrup, then the second strut will take it to the support. So this is the strut, this is the, the ties in the beam, the shear ties. That is what they're doing. They're basically taking the load back up to the compression and then to the support. So that means this portion will need a shear design for this force. And when it becomes longer, you will need that, still it is possible. When it becomes very long, you might need to have many divisions and it becomes a normal beam. So basically what we are saying is that the strutted type concept can work. The only thing is that sometimes we may need intermediate trusses, which means intermediate hangers to complete the truss. In some cases, we don't need that. If we don't need a vertical member, it's a true truss, no shear. If you need a vertical member to carry the load up, that means there is shear. And we need to design, the design for shear in that portion. And bending is taken by this and that. So to summarize, we can have that or that or that. All right, so final picture for today is this one. You can have a stretch and tie like this, or like that, or like that, or like that. As the beam becomes longer and longer, you need more diagonal members, more vertical members. So this is a beam, and up to here, it's a pure deep beam. This is a beam. All right? Okay, we're almost done. Any questions?